uh, I see a lot of NetCDF and CF experts out there. Who's uh, who's new to NetCDF? Few new people. Who's new to CF? All right, good. Okay. Well, this is for you. And all those experts are here to answer your questions along with. <laughs> Um, so what is NetCDF? I'm going to do some of this kind of quickly because I'm assuming everybody at least knows what NetCDF is sort of and uh, has, oh, I'm sorry. Hi, I'm Ethan Davis uh, from Unidata at UCAR in Boulder, Colorado. And uh, we um, we support the NetCDF libraries, C and Java and some other stuff and lots of other stuff. And uh, We've been active in the CF community for a long time. There's been some a lot of effort lately around CF. And if you're interested, there's a workshop the, to lay the next session after this and the first three sessions tomorrow, including the overlapping of the overlapping with the ease of plenary. Oops, um, <clears throat> that is about CF and its governance and how things are moving and how things are evolving. So if you're interested, uh, there's that as well. And I'll let Ryan. Tell you who he is later when he starts stands up here and I do something else. Okay, binary data format, uh, NetCDF software libraries and APIs. C and Java are the main ones, and then some wrappers around other things or for other things. Uh, and data model. Anyway, uh, conceptual model of the what the data looks like in in there. Um, and uh, Right, the binary data format, there's actually three now, maybe, the original, like uh, Nessie of three, and then uh, one that can, can contain extra long data, so it has larger offsets and whatever. And then uh, Nessie of four, of course, builds on top of HDF5. So, um, okay, data model, so it's the important part. Classic data model, basically multi-dimensional arrays, with data values and then uh, shared that shared dimensions, shared named dimensions, and then attributes. And uh, there we go. There's a little prick picture of some data and its dimensions or maybe coordinates. Uh, dimensions. I haven't mentioned coordinates yet. And this is just a CDL. Is everybody familiar with Net Net CD enough? Net CDF enough to recognize CDL? This is kind of the the text little language that we describe NetCDF in uh, with. Uh, so dimensions, variables, attributes. Um, yeah, so we're going to be using some of that later uh, in the rest of this and uh, just to kind of capture the picture of what we're talking about in terms of NetCDF. Uh, since NetCDF 4, there's an enhanced data model which adds group structure, hierarchical structures, and um, yeah, structures are something different. I'm not even going to talk about that. Uh, there's a and there's a few extra data types as well, uh, in 64s which and strings, which uh, classic model did not uh, include. Um, okay, that's the data model. I have some UML diagrams, but nobody likes those, so I'm not showing them uh, unless somebody really wants them. And then I can. But uh, so these are the two data models, and we'll get into this a little more, or at least we'll kind of have some experience with what this looks like in a little while. Um, CF conventions, they have long supported gridded data, uh, time series and uh, soundings and that kind of thing are really new for CF. They've been around for about 10 years, uh, maybe eight, eight or 10. And then unstructured structured grids have been around uh, they're not officially part of CF at the moment, but they're kind of working uh, and trying to make sure that they work well with CF. Um, those have been around for four, four or five years. And CF radial has been around for a while too. That's for radar and, well, it says it up there, radar and LIDAR, uh, that kind of thing. And that's also not uh, officially part of CF and there's, uh, it's unclear how they're gonna stay related or how closely they're gonna be related, but they're gonna try to uh, in some way, oops. 
Uh, we've also, there's been some, oh, I, I, I didn't move one of these up. I, sorry, Daniel, this is, uh, groups is in the under development and it should be up in the uh, accepted. So currently, or up till now, CF hasn't had groups, the, the NETSIA 4, the extend enhanced data model groups, uh, it hasn't really supported that. So there's a proposal that will allow for that and support it in a CF way. Time series, uh, so polygons and polylines. Uh, I'll have some diagrams of some of this uh, stuff later just to zip through and see, so you can see what it looks like. Satellite SWAT data, link data, okay, and data uncertainty. So those are some things kind of under development. So gridded data, and here's uh, unstructured grid or U-grid, uh, the triangular grid type stuff as well. Uh, time series soundings and the like, and these are different uh, different applications. Looking at these different things, there's so IDV is a product that we've developed at Unidata. Um, Panoply is one from NASA. Uh, just the, some a bunch of the Python uh, X-ray and MATLAB stuff. Anyway, don't need to go into that. Just so these are different applications that that can read these different types of data. This is the geometry, so this is an image of a, a drainage basin, and there's some river segments, and uh, I'm not a, I don't remember what all this, the right terms, so I'm going to get it wrong, but uh, river segments, and then the basins around those, um, and that's a little more about that, different types and what it's compatible with. Uh, satellite SWAT data, so these get pretty darn complicated. And Alexander, who was just here, he's been working on this one, but he had to leave uh, to uh, for something. And uh, anyway, so these are like the satellites, polar orbiting perhaps, that are uh, scanning. Their sensor is going across and they're forming this swath. Um, so they, Alexander and others have developed this various types of structures of data that uh, can get pretty, this is like the most complex one, so sorry. I don't know why I included that one. Um, but these are just some of the different types of data that you can capture in net CDF, a uh, CF. CF radial, so scanning and sweeping up and down, and then just a time, I think that last one is, points vertically and uh, just goes in time. Anyway, okay, so, on to CF, kind of the basics of where you, the different pieces that you want to uh, include. And if anybody was here for the last session on the NASA data, for developers guide for data producers, right. <laughs> Thank you. Um, some of this is, at least um, I, I guess I'm more familiar with the the DIWG uh, recommendations document. So, so those documents or those recommendations include, uh, one of them is including uh, various attributes uh, like units and standard name and a valid min, max, and that kind of thing. So these are some of the different pieces that you would want to include in a CF file to help capture the meaning of your data. So units are mandatory for all, well, data variables, all physical, what, what am I trying to say? All variables that have a physical, that are physical, represent physical quantities. So UD units is another software package that's been around for a long time and deals with uh, units. And so CF has uh, gone along with UD units and it's basically so the units attribute, the value of a unit's attribute has to be recognizable by the UD unit software. And UD units builds off of uh, uh, NIST, there's NIST uh, units uh, standards and stuff, so it's all going along with that. <clears throat> and then see, uh, UD units also represents time as a uh, value from, uh, Anyway, hours since this or seconds since a particular timestamp in it. So it's an uh, a float or whatever that you're actually capturing uh, in the time dimension or time coordinate var variable. So, but this units is like this, hours since this time. And that would be assumed to be 
zero Z of 10.15, so midnight. Standard names are the things that, uh, the names, a, a controlled vocabulary of names for uh, representing what the data, the physical, the physical quantity represented by the data variables. So a uh, standard name consists of the name, which is can be long and is uh, underscore delimited words, uh, canonical units, and then a definition. So in the, in the process for that is uh, CF has an email list and it's moving to a GitHub uh, uh, repository and there'll be uh, issues for discussion. But that is where standard names, new standard names are proposed. And we get, CF probably gets, I don't know how many every month. Is that, I think it's a monthly release or is it quarterly release? Dave, do you know? Quarterly. So, and there's usually a fair number of new standard names each quarter that get added. Um, I was looking at a document from, I don't know, 10 or 15 years ago that saying, introducing or talking about CF standard names and saying uh, that there were 380 some standard names. And now there's, I don't know, 4,000 or, or more. So uh, they, they, they're fairly easy to get added. There's some discussion and some debate and whatever, but uh, this is the part of CF that changes in a fairly regular way, uh, uh, regular time scale, I guess. So when you actually store something, a, a variable, uh, and, and use a standard name, the units for that variable have to be uh, consistent with the uh, uh, canonical units, right, of the standard name. So, and there's other modifiers to the standard names, and I'm not going to get into that right now, but that also plays a part in units sometimes. So dimensions uh, are just the size of the array in a particular direction. Uh, coordinate variables are these, I'm gonna, can I do this? No. Uh, no. I'm trying to do it so that people online can see it, but uh, okay, I'm not gonna bother with that. Uh, anyway, this float, the, under the, the first thing under the variables, lat, lat, lat uh, parentheses lat, is what is called a uh, coordinate variable from the net, NetCDF user's guide, so that's even before CF, and it, um, when the name of the variable and the name of the dimension, and there's only one, matches, then it's called a coordinate variable, it's handled very specifically, it has to be numeric, and it has to be monotonically increasing or decreasing, so not scrambled up in any way. Um, and that allows uh, standard tools to be able to uh, uh, do various things with data that that follows that convention, they can map it, use those coordinate variables to map things onto the Earth or whatnot. Okay, and uh, cell bounds are when a, uh, if the data point doesn't actually represent a point, it, it represents that, that, uh, that quantity, how it, over the field, the full extent of a cell. So there's a ways to do that. We'll have a little example later on that we can poke at or at least talk about uh, that. Anyway, so we'll get back to this. But these are basically attached to a coordinate variable, so they are part of a coordinate system, really. If you have something, yeah, they are make up part of the coordinate system, coordinate variable. Okay, well, that's kind of my intro to the basics. I'm Ethan. This is Ryan. This is the CF uh, CF webpage, that top one, conventions.org. And then the one below that, that is uh, the GitHub repo. Uh, that's the, organiza the, the organization which has multiple repositories under it. So, um, and any questions on that CDF or CF? All right. Well, good. Okay. Ryan is going to.
take over. All right. Can you guys hear me now? There we go. Um, so if you'd like to follow along, um, first off, how many of you out there are not Python users? Handful of hands. Okay, well, that, that will make the next part of this a lot more relevant, so that's a good thing. For those of you not familiar with Python, this should be um, something that's straightforward to follow along with, but please do stop me and ask questions if you run into anything. Ethan will have the microphone so we can get those captured on the recording. Um, so if you want to follow along, there's this link here, this bit.ly slash ESIP 2019-cf.toot for tutorial. If you go there, it should spin up we call my binder. Oh, mine died. Um, all right, I guess I'm going to do this along with the rest of you. So if you go here, come down to the bottom of the repository, and there's this icon here that says launch binder. So if you click that, what it's going to do is it's going to spin up a Jupyter Notebook server for each of you that will have the notebook that we'll be using to go through the Python materials. And even in the absence of Python having taken off so much in um, the geosciences, one of the great reasons that to do this tutorial with Python is because um, the libraries that do NetCDF and Python are very straightforward to use, very expressive, and you don't have to deal with a lot of the typing that you would have to deal with, with in C or Fortran. So it's a lot easier to get past kind of the boilerplate code and really see what's going on and, and hit the ground running. So let me try blowing that up. All right. Sure. Make this bigger again. It is. Did I kill the... There it is. Okay. This link right here. All right. Get rid of a few of these things so we can see the screen here. All right. So I'm assuming my Python users in the room are all familiar with notebooks. If you're not, click on a cell and you can hit shift enter to run it and you can just keep walking through each of the cells in the notebook as we go along executing the code. So, <clears throat> with the CF conventions, one of the primary data types we work a lot with is talking about encoding gridded data within a NetCDF file and trying to do that in a fashion that allows us to interoperate with a lot of different tools so that we can pass our NetCDF files off to any number of other data users and they can throw them into standard tools and have the information we want pop up inside them. So we don't have to encode a lot of extra information outside the data file for them to be able to properly use our data files. So as we're walking through setting these up, um, let's start with this following hypothetical data set. It's going to be forecast model output um, that contains three-dimensional temperature data at a lot of different forecast hours. Um, the native coordinate system of the model is going to be a regular grid that's been projected onto a Lambert conformal projection. So to start, I'm going to run some Python code that tries to set up some, some prototype data here. Just in, in reality, we'd have another process here that had already generated these values for us somehow, some way. I don't want to focus on that, but just want to get us some Python arrays to work with to start putting into the NetCDF file. So we're going to create some times. We're going to create our X and Y coordinates. We'll have some standard pressure levels. From assuming this is kind of a weather forecast model, we use pressure as a vertical coordinate, and then we'll generate some random temperature values on our three-dimensional grid. So it's actually a four-dimensional grid, including time. So time, pressure, y, x is the size of our prototype data here. All right. The first line I'm going to run here, and on the Python side of things, why can't I get in there? There we go is 
We're going to use the NetCDF for Python library. Um, there's another library out there called X-Array that is very powerful, and I'd recommend if you are not familiar with it to take a look if you're a Python user. But it also hides a lot of the details of NetCDF behind it, and we kind of want to actually explore some of those details of working with the CF conventions. So we're going to work with just the straight NetCDF API. So to start, we're going to create a new NetCDF file, open it for writing. Um, we're using this mode called diskless, so that just we're not worried about writing a file to disk. Also, gave me a lot more flexibility when um, working on these tutorial materials. So that's where we'll start. It's keeping the, instead of having a file on disk back in this data set, it's all keeping it in memory. And since we have a small data set we'll be working with, that's not going to be a problem. <clears throat> so that's creating our data set. So one of the first things the CF conventions talk about are some global attributes at the file level. Um, none of these are, strictly speaking, required, but a lot of these are a good idea to have. So the first one we're going to use is a conventions attribute that helps set one or more conventions that the file obeys so that data or tools can look at that and understand, okay, we're using the CF conventions. I should look for certain attributes and be able to parse the file. From there, some of the suggested attributes would be a title for the data, institution that created it, maybe a source of your data. Um, conventions also recommend a history attribute that contains a history of modifications that have been, un been done to the data set, as well as any re relevant references, or there's also a, a global comment attribute. And so because these are in the, the conventions document, these are things that you know, can be considered standard and tools can at least look for and, and try to do things with. So we can run that cell and that's setting those attributes in Python. And so now we have our, what the CDL representation of our data set looks like at this point. So we only have attributes. We've done nothing to actually store any kind of data information, just metadata. So, one of the things about the NetCDF data model over something like HDF is this idea of shared dimensions between the variables. And so we want to, before we go ahead and creating all of our variables within the file and all our data, put our data within the file, we need to go ahead and create the dimensions we're going to use that are shared between those variables. And so that's what we're going to do here, is we're going to create each of the dimensions that represent our forecast model output. So in this case, we have the forecast time is one of our dimensions. So the various hours of the forecast. Um, we also have our X dimension, Y dimension, and then pressure. And so I'm setting the size of each of these using the array of data uh, we created up above. If we didn't want to do that, we could do something like um, manually putting in the numbers. You know, we could say, X is 101 if we wanted to. The only other one to note here is for forecast time, we say none. In this case, I'm using this to, in Python, it uses that to define this as an unlimited dimension within the file. So that means we could go back and later append and add more time steps for our forecast output if we wanted to. It's important to note with at least um, the CF conventions, you're only allowed to have one unlimited dimension. So we can run this, and we can see what the, the output, how the Python represents that data set as a string now, or better yet, we can just kind of look what the CDL of this would look like at this point now. And so what we've gained now is the dimensions here. We have the forecast times unlimited, currently has 13 items, or at least it would once we write data to it. We have the X dimension, the Y dimension, and the pressure dimension. So still really only metadata in the file at this point, but now we've essentially set up the entire file for the kind of information we want to be storing within it now. So from here, let's actually put in, start working on putting data into this file. So the first thing we do is we're going to create the temperature variable. Create variable temperature, we give it the name. So to give it the name temperature, all the variables in NetCDF have a particular data type assigned to them, be it int 16 or int 32 or short and long. Um, 
or shorten an int. Um, or we have floats and doubles. So we're going to set up temperature to be floating point values. And then when we create it, we list all the dimensions. Let me wrap, shorten this. Um, so we give it all the dimensions that are all of the names of the dimensions that correspond to the data we're going to be writing out. And so our temperature variable here is a function of forecast time and pressure and y and x. And then the last part, at least as far as the Python API is concerned, you can also do this from C. I just remember what the calls look like, but we tell it zlib equals true so that we're doing the compression when we store our data. And so that can shrink our file a little bit versus not compressing at all. That's one of the benefits of using NetCDF4 as opposed to the NetCDF3 format. So run that, we've created our variable. From there, this is all it takes now to write out some actual data to the file. We can take the variable we created. So this is Python syntax for what we call a full slice of the array. What that's saying is all the values in that variable fill with our temps array that we created above. And so now we've written out all the values corresponding to our 13 forecast times, seven pressure levels, and y and x. If we wanted to, if they say you didn't have an array, maybe your forecast model output is too big, you don't have the memory to store the entire time history of all the 3D forecasts in memory, you want to do this one slice at a time, you can do the same that you can manage that as well. So we could say, um, you know, we could make a loop here and say then give us set up an index here starting at zero and loop through all the slices in temperatures and pass that index into our variable to tell it to write, we're just writing this portion of the output variable and just putting in the one slice. It's kind of a little, in, in this notebook, it's kind of a little um, contrived to do it this way because we already have all the data in memory. But if you had some kind of forecast model where you'd only have parts of it, you can control where in your output variable you're actually writing these values. So now this is what the CDL looks like. In addition to our dimensions, we now have gained this variable. We've got the floating point temperature. That's a function of forecast time pressure, Y and X. That's all well and good but now we want to try and continue to help make it conform to the CF conventions. And so one thing that's required is a units attribute and that helps for anything that's has a physical dimensionality to it. We have to provide a units attribute that contains that information. And it must be parsable by the UD units library in order to be a properly formatted unit string for the CF conventions. Um, and then one thing to mention is for NASA data set interoperability recommendations, they also recommend including basic CF attributes. So including units, long name, standard name, development and max, scale factor and add offset, as well as anything else that are included, even if they're optional in the CF spec, they're recommended to be included for NASA data sets here, or at least their, their interoperability recommendations say to do so. So what we're going to do here is we're going to go ahead and assign the units. I'm going to assign a standard name of air temperature. So if you go through the standard name table, you can find any number of, of physical quantities that are listed there. Air temperature is the one that applies to this output. Give it a long name. That's kind of a description variable. So if you had could think of automated software trying to load these data, that would probably be a field it would use to try and describe, label your plots or whatnot for you automatically. Hypothetically speaking, we might have areas in the domain of the grid that are missing. Maybe if they were you were trying to do something over land and we're not running it over water or something, you might flag those as missing. So we can encode those in the CF conventions with the missing value attribute. And here I set it to a value of negative 9999. So just setting a bunch of attributes now. We've already written the data. It's only providing additional metadata to help interpretation of our file.
And so our segment of the CDL that's relevant here is this is what it now is defined in our output. So the standard name comes from the controlled vocabulary from CF video, uh, standard names, right? That's correct. Okay. Can we use any other standards? Um, for the CF conventions, I don't believe so. Um, but there are, I believe it was in the, the NASA interruptibility document does define listing other controlled vocabularies within the, some of the metadata. CF doesn't say you can't use other, have attributes that it doesn't recognize. So you can include other things. It's just not a CF, in a standard CF location. Um, I'm just. Of what? Including other vocabularies in a non standard location. I don't know about that. Uh, so I'm noticing up there that there's now a conflict between missing value and fill value, and how is is that resolved somehow, either by you or the library? So I don't believe so because technically speaking, fill value is what's used by the NetCDF library when it initializes the memory into the file. So we'll fill all those. Missing value is allowed to differ because that's an intentional value that you flag when you write your data to say these values are missing. Oftentimes those are used interchangeably on the display and analysis side, because you probably don't want to be running calculations with data that still have a fill value or have a missing value, but it is allowed within the spec to have those be different values, because they have slightly different um, meanings. Fill value is what the library uses when it initializes memory. Missing value is what I use to flag data that are missing. And. Uh... Uh, I'll also mention for the missing value, you could also use valid min and valid max or valid range to indicate if you could, if you wanted to do that instead of a missing value. It just depends on your data and how you want to. So in that case, anything beyond those range will become a missing value. Or anything outside the range is a missing value or a fill value? Okay. We still have to. Okay. Well, invalid. Hey, Ryan. Um, so we want to talk about the art form part of this is, you know, fill, fill value is what it is. In the past, we have made some errors with choosing large negative numbers that actually could take on whatever we're measuring actually could take on that value in some theoretical sense. What was the decision behind using minus 9999? Um, I use negative 9999 here as an example because the values are in Kelvin. And so can't have negative values for Kelvin. Um, but there's definitely an art form of, yes, trying to f choose sensible values when you're, if you have a, a, a bi-directional range that can go positive or negative, you definitely want to be very careful. Um, and especially with floating point values and, and trying to test floating point uh, equality can be challenging. So um, I think valid min and valid max almost in some of those cases might be your better, um, your better, way of doing that so you can kind of pin down the range. And, um, you know, the, many quantities due to the laws of physics don't actually have an unbounded range. I mean, floating point goes up to, you know, 10 to the 36th power. There are not a lot of things we do in the geosciences that go that high in normal units. Any other questions? By all means, do feel free to interrupt me like this. I don't want to be up here talking for 45 minutes. You will fall asleep. My throat will start to hurt. Okay, so that's the first part of just getting the data out and writing it all out. We're still not compliant with the full spec because there's a lot more things we need to do here in order to properly have files that are truly self-descriptive and can be used by... Um, data users without actually having to come back to us for information. For instance, we've done nothing to actually state how these data are referenced in time and space. We've given dimensions, but we've not assigned any kind of coordinate values to know where in X, Y, time, vertical, these data are located. 
So to start, we're going to use we're going to work on our x and y coordinate values. So here I define one variable x and one variable y. Um, they have standard names that allow being recognized as being used by the projections. We'll we'll talk about the projections in a second. <clears throat> They also include an optional axis attribute that helps define this is the x axis or these values correspond to the x axis these values correspond to the y axis we have a required units attribute here which in this case is kilometers and i gave it a long name just so users of the file have some kind of clue just try to can help convey more intent here of what these data represent So the next one, after we've done X and Y, we'll talk about our vertical coordinate, which in this case is pressure. So here I create a variable pressure. And so one thing to note, I kind of glossed over, in the CF conventions, and really this comes dates back to the NetCDF user's guide, um, these coordinate variables are readily identified because they match their dimension name. So we have dimensions of X, Y, pressure, and forecast time. So we create these coordinate variables to have the same name, X, Y, pressure, and forecast time. That makes them simple to identify for tools, and that's how the conventions lay out for um, your primary coordinate variables to be defined this way. So for pressure, we create the pressure variable. It's also going to be floating point, and it's a function of our pressure dimension. The units here are hectopascals. Again, we use this axis attribute like we did before. This time it's the z-axis because that's our vertical coordinate. We give it a standard name, which is actually the standard names are frequently how, um, or at least how this one is usually identified is by giving the appropriate standard name. And then for vertical coordinates, there's an attribute called pressure, or uh, excuse me, there's an attribute called positive. This is how we can define whether um, whether the variable increases as you go upwards or decreases as you go upwards. For pressure, it's assumed, or the default assumptions, which is what makes this optional, is that pressure decreases as you go up. So positive is down for pressure. If you wanted, if you had a height variable or altitude or something like that, or depth, this is where you could encode that unambiguously. You could say for depth, it increases downwards. For height, it increases upwards. And so you can use that attribute so that you don't have to have previously agreed with your tool maker, you know, what these things mean, but instead you have the appropriate metadata here to indicate how to interpret this variable. So that gets us X, Y, and Z for the axes here are done. Now we need to talk about time. So as Ethan mentioned earlier, time units are, are encoded in this way in the CF conventions. You encode it as some kind of time unit, seconds, minutes, hours, days, since some kind of reference time. And that allows us to then take time and express it um, concretely as a set of floating point values. You don't want to be used, you want to try to avoid using months and years because those have very um, Variable definitions, number of days in a month is not fixed. The number of days in a year varies. There are some calendars you can get into in the CF conventions. I really don't want to go into the details here, but for a lot of climate applications, you can assume a 360 day year and things like that. There are parts of the spec that do talk about this, but it gets very convoluted quickly. Hi, Heather from NCEI. Um, so would that statement, would you be able to say that using seconds since you really can get away with not using calendar attribute? Because we use it a lot and I'd rather not. <sighs> I'm gonna profess my ignorance to the details of the convention spec here, but I would open it up to people who are much more well-versed in it in this room. That's okay. So there's a default calendar. Ken says there is a, a default calendar. 
Gregorian proleptic or whatever. <laughs> yeah, there's Gregorian, but it's also dependent on the application you use for NetCDF as well sometimes. So <sighs> even with the libraries, so you have to be careful. Yes, you do need to be very careful with your calendar and, and time is a place where you can go down lots of dragon infested rabbit holes. Any other? All right. Any calendar comments? <laughs> Nobody? <laughs> All right. So earlier when I was creating my prototype data above, we used some Python date time instances to try and just create some times off of now. If you're a Python user and you're trying to do CF convention things, you want to take a look at the CF time module. A lot of work's been put into this module in terms of helping to convert, um, work with CF time, like this this encoding with the units since offset. Um, it contains a parser for that. It understands a lot of the different calendars that CF supports, and it makes it very straightforward to take Python date times and convert them to what we want. So I'm going to be using this date to num function out of the CF time module. I specify my time units here as I'm going to go with hours since, and then I'm putting in here whatever the first time in there was, or at least the first date in the list of times was with a time of zero. So if we look up above, I think I started at, I started at now, but then I replaced the hour with 22 Z and then I went out 13 hours after that. So we'll see if we get that back out down here. Yeah, so when I run that, now I get out 22 hours since the start of the day, 23, 24, 25, so on. So now I have an array of floating point values rather than my net CDF time or the, the Python date times to work with. So now we create our forecast time variable, just like the others. Why are you? Okay. So forecast time. Since these are whole um, whole numbers of hours, I went ahead and made them integers. Yeah. Question. Yeah. So forecast time is that one of the standard names? No. So one of the things about the CF conventions is um, variable names are not prescribed, and dimension names are not prescribed. So nothing in CF is identified by the name of the variable other than it matches the dimension name. Where you're going to get the, the, the standard whatever's, you know, standard name or standard identification is by something like axis T for the time axis, or also the fact that the standard name is listed as time. And actually, dating back to the earliest, ver earliest versions of the spec, um, the fact that it has a unit string that looks like that already defines it as a time variable or as, as your time dimension in the NetCDF CF spec. So then the standard name there is, uh, will this library tell me if I'm using something that's not standard? Will which library tell you if you're not using uh, it? Uh, CF time? Yes. Um, or, uh, what are we doing? What do you mean it's, not standard? So, so you have a list of uh, standard dimension names? So no, it, it won't care about the dimension names. If we're looking at the functionality in the CF time library, all it cares about is you're giving it, well, in this case, you're giving it a list of Python date time objects, and it's give, you're giving it a time unit string and optionally a calendar. So it will look at the calendar string and it'll look at the unit string you're giving it and tell you if that meets the spec or not. The name of the dimension and the name of the variable are not part of the spec, but they don't matter. As long as your dimension name and your variable name are the same, it's a coordinate variable. And then if it has that type of date, uh, that type of unit string, now it's a time coordinate variable. So um, I define my unit string up here. So now I just go ahead and reuse it when I'm setting it in the file. Going ahead and, you know, going above and beyond by setting the standard name to time and setting the access to T just to, one, show you all the 
the options you have, but it doesn't hurt to put in extra information just in case, you know, conventions are great and all, the actual conformance of tools in the wild to said convention can be interesting. So covering all your bases and providing as much of the information that you understand is never a bad thing. I mean, in an era of gigabyte and terabyte data sets, a few bytes for an extra attribute is, is nothing, so. So, create my time variable. And now here's what our full CDL looks like. We've got our X variable. I shrink that just, there we go. Just so we can fit it on one page here, shrink that back down a little bit. So we have our X variable that has all the appropriate metadata, the Y, pressure, forecast time, and then temperature down here. So now we are at least able to reference our data now in time and space. And you might think we were done. You would be mistaken. So the one bit of information here we're missing is we've not put in any kind of information about latitude and longitude. And so that's required in order to be compliant with the CF convention spec. <clears throat> and this makes sense because we can't actually, couldn't take this forecast model data and put it on a globe anywhere. We have no idea where it is. For some forecasts that are research and it's a hypothetical storm that might not be important, but for basic day-to-day -day weather, operational weather model forecasts, other sets of gridded data, you really want to be able to locate this, not just in time, not just in the vertical, but somewhere, you know, on the planet we live on. Or, or I think technically speaking, it would support other geoids, so you could do, I think on Mars, but don't hold me to that. <laughs> well, I just uh -oh. to make the comment that we, we do data, measure data in space. And we'd like to use the conventions, and we can't because of that. Do we have the, the cognizant parties in here who could actually address that? that? <laughs> because I couldn't. <laughs> we'd like to just leave some of that information blank. And um, of course, none of the valid, the, I, eventually I'll have a question about validators, but um, okay. it's, it's a problem. That's a, that's a good point. Is it coordinate systems that are the problem? And I, I'm reporting somebody else's experience, but the validators that he tried to use, he couldn't use any of them, so he felt very lost at sea. It's like somebody needs to propose an extension to CF to handle whatever the problem is. Okay. <laughs> All right, well, since nominally, at least, I've only ever worked with data on the Earth, so I'm using Latin lawns, and then that's what the spec says is you have to have them. Um, so we need to write some latitudes and longitudes to our file before we're completely done here. And so... You know, I, I'm just going to say, I think CF definitely was is focused on Earth, the Earth, and coordinate systems and whatever. Um, I don't think there is a reason that, I mean, there are certainly parts of it that should be applicable to any data. Uh, it, it, it may not be half latitude, you know, it may not be fully CF. Well, I don't know. Uh, I'm, now I'm, I'm not sure I know what I'm saying here, but. Uh, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll continue uh, later. I am generally supportive of anyone trying to use standardized metadata conventions to make their data more useful and more self-describing than some of the other questionable bespoke formats we use in the sciences. So for our purposes, we're gonna be using Python's PyProj library so we can take our coordinates and our knowledge of the coordinate system we're in and go ahead and generate those latitudes and longitudes. So if you've not seen it before, this is the PyProj library. It lap, wraps the formerly Proj 4, but now that they release versions 5 and 6, now just the Proj library. So it wraps that in Python and gives us all, it's an extensive library of projections. 
So here we take our 1D X and Y coordinates, make them a 2D um, set of 2D coordinates. We set up our projection here, which I said above was Lambert conformal. Um, I've made up some values here defining what the origin and the standard latitude and all that is. And here we'll set the radius of the Earth to be a sphere or set it to a spherical Earth with a radius of 63, 71 kilometers. And then we'll use that to convert our X and Y coordinates to longitude and latitude, taking care to convert from kilometers to meters because that's what Praj wants. All right, so again, converted to longitude and latitude. Now let's set up our metadata for this. So here we create a variable. We'll go ahead and write them out in doubles just to be extra sure we have enough precision to hold the number of digits for geolocating things. <clears throat> because our native grid was you know, one dimensional X and Y's, we gotta have two dimensions for the longitudes and latitudes. So they are both, the longitudes and latitudes vary with both Y and X. So we set that there, write out the data here. This is one of the required parts for the spec is we need to have units of degrees east or various capitalizations thereof, but it's degrees east for longitude. We also give it the optional standard name of longitude but it's really this unit string is, is the primary way the specification defines how you say this is a longitude. We do the same thing for latitude below, the only difference being the units are degrees north. Oop. And here I misspelled name. Okay, so we've got longitude and latitude. So before, you may remember me saying coordinate variables, primary coordinate variables are, def are um, detected, formed in the CF spec by virtue of the fact that you have the name of the variable is the same as the dimensions. Well, that's not the case here. One, it's two dimensional. Two, we have longitude or latitude or lawn and lat. And those don't match the dimension names. So we need some way to on the variables declare that these are the coordinates or that the variable you that our data variable uses these as coordinate variables or as coordinate values there we go and so we do that with the coordinates att attribute so on our temperature variable we set this coordinates attribute and we set it to a string of lawn space lat so that's a space separated list of the variable names corresponding to what we call the auxiliary coordinates And that's how, you know, it, that's how a tool that's only looking at the temperature variable can now determine, oh, I need to look at these other variables in order to get relevant coordinate information to get my longitudes and latitudes. And so now we have these additional variables that are doubles, and then we've also added our coordinates attribute. So does this change for station data where the, the physical measurement is not changing? You can have far less information. Uh, I believe so. And I will run through an example using the DSG, the station data type uh, spec in a few minutes. Okay. So if I don't answer your question or show you what you're looking for, then hit me up again. And we'll see. So at this point, I think our, our data are now fully compliant. We've got longitude, latitude information. We can put them on the globe properly. We've have the vertical coordinate information. We have times. We have all the information we need for somebody to make sense of our data. The one other subject that bears covering here on this, this detail is coordinates in system information. So it's not required to put this in here, but if you'd like, clients of your data to be able to understand what the mapping was between the original grid and latitude, longitude, and space. If you want to have more information than just this set of discrete latitudes and longitudes, 
we can do that using a grid mapping attribute or a grid mapping variable. So when we set that up in an NetCDF file, what we're essentially doing is we create a dummy variable in the file. Here I'm creating, it's, I just, the name doesn't matter. Its name could be whatever you want to call it. And I'm just giving it a type of int32. And here I actually don't give it any kind of shape. So it's actually just a scalar variable. What we're doing is we're using the dummy variable as a namespace for holding a bunch of other attributes that we can then reference from the other variables. And so I'm just creating a variable to hang all these attributes off of. And now here's where I actually specify all the coordinate system information. So the first and probably most important one of these is the grid mapping name. That comes from a, a controlled list in the CF spec of various supported grid mappings. In this case, we're using the Lambert conformal conic grid mapping. And then each of those ones in the spec have different attributes that they support. Uh, I think all of them support things like semi-major axis for helping to define the, the geoid for the earth. In this case, we're just specifying the one. So it's a spherical earth. And then here are parameters specifying the details of the Lambert conformal projection. So once we've added that to the file, we still need to specify that our temperature field is actually using that as its coordinate system. And so that's what we do here is we say we add a grid mapping attribute to our temperature variable. And then this is set to the name of the variable we created above, of our dummy variable. So we called it Lambert projection up here. And so that attribute needs to have reference that variable name. So here's our, here are the variables we've been working with here in this, what the CDL looks like. So our int Lambert projection, again, we never even wrote any value to that variable. We only did a bunch of attributes on it. And then we set the grid mapping on our temperature variable. And then as an example of the cell bounds that Ethan mentioned during his presentation, um, and that's another recommendation from the NASA data set interoperability uh, recommendations, is using the CF bounds attribute. So when your data aren't representing a time, a particular uh, point value, but instead over you know, a span of coordinates, you can use the bounds to kind of indicate the period or, or, or the spatial domain over which that value is somehow related. So for instance, if you had a rain gauge that's read every three hours, but only dumped every six, could look something like this. So here's just the CDL representation here. We have our usual lat lon time. We have this dimension TBV, which is the bounds for our time values. And so now when we create our time coordinates, we set this additional bounds attribute called time bounds. which is another variable here that's a function of time and that TBV dimension. And so that's how we encode, instead of just a single point, we have a pair of values that represent the bounds for each of those observations. So for instance, here's our, our three, six, nine, 12, 15, our normal times, but then the bounds that correspond to them is zero, three corresponds to the first time 0, 06 would be the bounds for our second time, 6 to 9, the bounds for third one, and so on. <clears throat> it's a nice way to help encode, for instance, here where we have these overlapping times for our observations and to make clear that, that you have this kind of case. So before I move on to observational data, 
what questions do you have about the conventions in regards to the gridded data? So for the forecast data, which is two-dimensional, I'm a little confused why you would require it to be two-dimensional for a latitude and longitude, when essentially that's a coordinate dimension along one axis. Couldn't you just reduce that? You couldn't reduce the latitude and longitude from 2D to 1D because the native grid was this projected, it was a conical section on a sphere. So it's it's not, you know, the native coordinates of my grid were not latitude and longitude. And therefore, when we took our projected X and Y coordinates and mapped them back to latitude and longitude, you didn't have any um, any redundancy because each point in the grid had a unique Latin lawn. If you've ever seen those those weather maps where instead of a rectangle, you have this, it looks like it's a wrapped off of a cone, that kind of thing where no one, there are no rows in Latin lawns, there are rows in some kind of projected coordinate space. And so that's that's why you need the two dimensional lats and lawns. I am not this good of a teacher. You must have questions. This isn't really a question, but I'm looking forward to um, future sessions within this conference where we talk about extending CF to other vocabularies and other, well, time constraints. Because calendar times do not work very well for data that are prior to zero AD that goes back 600 million years before present. Will there, will there, when, when, when would you suggest I bring these kinds of topics up in the sessions that are going to be coming up? You mean in uh, the sessions here at ESIP? Yeah. Well, so there's four more sessions following this one that are about CF, advancing CF, reviewing some proposals that have already, you know, you know where they are and such, and uh, we may have, we can certainly, that could come up there. Uh, and it has, to, I have talked to other people who deal with a million years ago, whatever million years ago, and uh, or millions of years ago. And, and yeah, we haven't really looked at that in CF, I guess. So, but if, you know, it just takes somebody who needs to use it to uh, push on it and, and make it happen. So. I have no idea how that would really fit with current calendars and time and stuff. So tomorrow, tomorrow uh, third session of the day. Uh, so we don't have the um, millions of years problem. Uh, our our data is only about a hundred years worth. Uh, but uh, the <laughs> our our community is separated the calendar day from the time of the day, and I was wondering if the, the units uh, would be a good way to represent the pre precision I know the time uh, of my data. So it either be like day since or minutes since. So you have two separate variables with that information? Uh, no, they'd be separate data sets. Oh. Which people might want to put together, but That should still be, that shouldn't be a problem with the spec. I mean, you could even put those, I think, in the same file. Um, it would allow it as long as they're referenced. I mean, as long as they're still one dimensional coordinate variables are easy. You can still do even two dimensional times, I think, but that gets scary. Um, so I guess I'm not sure what the challenge is. How to represent the precision that oh. I know my time. So like we, okay. I have profile data, it's, mm -hmm. it's observational, uh, but it has different use cases. So it, uh, the original idea was uh, climate change essentially. And so if you knew what day it was or even what month that tended to be good enough, but then other users showed up and they wanted to do things on a much shorter time scale, like 
have uh, processes that occur within a day. Okay. And we didn't have a way to tell them that maybe this part of our data set isn't good for you and this other part is. Okay. Ethan, wasn't there a way you could encode? Oh, Ken? Yeah, it sounds like an uncertainty to me. Okay. Which I think is part of the spec, right? No? no oh, that's right. It was one of the things coming. Yeah, yes. Okay. That's why it sounded familiar. So, yes, you should come to the rest of the workshop. And, and... I will be at the rest of the workshop. <laughs> There's a question in the back. There are a couple questions in the back. Uh-oh. Hi. I might have misunderstood, but it sounds more like cell bounds is just the answer there. You can have a coordinate value just an instantaneous point in time. It's the cell bounds that tell you the period over which it's valid for, be it six hours representing part of a dynal cycle or 30 days, whatever. If I understood correctly. Another. I'm guessing my question is in another session. Um, are you going to go over CF checkers and validators? I wasn't planning necessarily going over them, but I think we'll have some time so we can certainly talk about some. I actually am not a competent user of them, so I would be relying on someone else's knowledge of them. I think that's a good subject. Yeah, and uh, this is our first time trying to do this, so uh, we we want to hear these things and that's definitely that's definitely something that we don't have in here yet but we need to add and also i think doing doing this kind of thing and then having the data set and using a tool to read in that file and show either checkers or other tools that show what you can do with what some tools can do at the different stages of depending on how much metadata you've added that would be one other thing i would like to add uh, to this uh, notebook. Anybody else? Just to comment on that question, the US IUS group has a really good validator that validates against CF and different versions of CF as well as ACDD, so I recommend that. I know that the CF conventions, they, or, org has a couple links to CF validators, but I found, yeah, the IUS one is really very good and, and actively uh, um, developed. <coughs> oh, one more question. I was interested in validators anyway, but uh, you know, we just go out and search for valid. If there was um, some kind of reference of validators, that would be helpful. ESIP would be a really what? Just to add, uh, you just do a search on the IOS compliance checker, you will find those validators that uh, was mentioned earlier. Yeah. yeah, there is a reference for that. It's called Google CF Convention Checker. <laughs> I know, I'm, I'm kidding. Okay. Any other? Uh... Oh. Yeah, I wanted to make a comment about the lat long from space earlier, but somehow uh, something went wrong with my voice. Uh, <clears throat> there is actually an equivalent of lat long to space. They're called the concept of declination and the concept of right ascension. So do consider those things. Right ascension is the uh, equivalent to longitude and then latitude is the declination. Have a look at that one. I think uh, you can you can substitute that, but it's not under CF. It's not any. Well, and yeah, I mean, it would be they have them come talk uh, and try to if the you know if. It, if we want to move in this direction, then it would require working with them, with the CF community to develop something that would work.
space weather is a bit important. It impacts the climate. Those were two comments, just uh, repeating since they didn't have the microphone. Any other uh, questions? Okay. All right. Now it looks like my my notebook server shut itself down. So let's see what happens here. Oh, good kernel error. That's all right. We can. I can make this work. So leading into observation data, you know, we had all this grid of data. It's nice. It's regularly ordered. You have, you know, three dimensions worth of points that are defined by, you know, separable 1D sets of coordinates. It's not what we usually have in observation data. You have points that are irregularly located in space and you need to define each one's location uniquely. And then you may have data that are um, not necessarily even, um, so like a time series, you might not even be collecting all the data at the same times. Um, that's a case I've not necessarily prepared here to, to present that detail. We're gonna start with the, the easy case here. We can talk more about what it takes when you have problems like not, not uniform collection. So I'm gonna come back up here in my imports and then I'm gonna go back down here. Okay, so, so when we're talking about these irregularly spaced points, this is what the CF conventions describe as the conventions for discrete sampling geometries or DSGs. And so hypothetically, it's work with regularly sampled, maybe all the same height kind of profile data. So we have a few stations that are releasing maybe balloons, maybe they just got some kind of vertically looking sounding or profilers or RAS or who knows. So here I've got three stations and then I've got a set of heights going from 10 meters to a thousand meters, we'll say. And then I'm gonna create some random temperature profile data. Okay, so our basic setup, I'm not gonna go quite as in depth on the attributes as I did the first time. <clears throat> we'll set up our data set just like we did before. This time our dimensions are not X and Y. So this time we have one dimension that represents our different stations that we're collecting, our, our features. So the, the DSGs, the discrete sampling geometries have a notion of of different features and then you have some dimensions corresponding to the shape of each of those features. So in this case, the features correspond to each of the stations we have. And then the size of those features is controlled here. We have heights. So each feature has a fixed set of heights. And then we're also going to create this other dimension for string length that allows us to store our string station IDs as, um, as a character array within NetCDF. The only other required attribute we have here is we use this feature type attribute at the global level to define what type of feature is gonna be present within our NetCDF file. And so the DSG conventions require um, only one type of feature per NetCDF file. So in this case, we're working with all profiles, so that's what we set the feature type attribute to be. And this is a, a uh, controlled list of options that are in the CF convention spec. So, so that's what our CDL looks like at this point in, in the game. There we go. So we have our, our three dimensions, and then we have a couple of global attributes We still do need to have latitudes and longitudes. So here we create a variable representing longitude, lon. This time it's a function of station. That's our, our feature dimension. 
do the same thing for latitude. And notice, just like before, I'll use our the standard name for longitude, degrees east for the units, and then for latitude, we do degrees north and a standard name of latitude. And standard refers to these as instant ver instance variables because each one refers to an instance of a feature. So each instance of a feature has a particular latitude and longitude. So in this case, each profile has a point where it was, where we were looking up from. Or if you were thinking maybe some kind of buoy in the ocean that's looking downwards and sampling at a depth, you could you know, just invert this. So here we set up our heights variable again. This should look similar when we did the pressure before. We have our heights, which is a, this is a function of our height dimension. So this is a standard coordinate variable. Units are meters, standard name is altitude. This time we use the positive attribute to specify it's increasing upwards. And then we write our heights to the variable. <clears throat> Last but not least, we want to uh, so we're going to write out our station IDs for each of the profile stations. So we create a variable here that's a, called STID. We use a define the type here using the letter C for character. So it's going to be a character array, a two-dimensional one that's a function of first dimension station. And the second dimension is string length. So it's an array of however many stations we have, three in this case, by four length four characters. So we have four character station IDs. Until the CF convention supports strings, which they don't yet officially, this is how we end up writing strings to the NetCDF variable. It does mean that you have to have the same amount of characters for each of your station IDs. So you can't do a nice kind of variable string length. I mean, you can have it filled with nulls or something, but essentially this array is going to be sized by your longest station identifier. There's one other required attribute we're using here. It's an attribute called CF role. And we assign that a value of profile ID, and that's telling, that, that, that's how the, um, in the convention we, indicate that this is a variable we use as the identifier for each of the features in here. So each one of these is a unique identifier for a given profile. So now we've thrown in all this coordinate variables to identify the locations of our features. So the one thing we're missing here is we've done spatial um, locating, but not time. So in this case, for argument's sake, let's say this NetCDF file represents profiles taken all at the same time. So we don't have a variable that's actually a function of any other dimensions here. It's just a scalar value. And so we can create that here. We can create our time variable, make it a float 32 in this case, not really important what its type is. We don't give it any dimensions, it's just a scalar. Here I'll use the units minutes since today 17z, give it the standard name of time, and then I assign it a value of five. So technically it was, the time is five minutes or 1705 today. But now again, it's a scalar variable no dimension information, so it's not yet a standard coordinate variable, so we still need to do some work here. So last but not least, now we're writing out our data, our temperature profiles. So we create a new temp a variable called temperature with a type of float32, and now this is dimensioned on station and heights.
give it our units of Celsius, standard name, air temperature, and then here's where we can indicate all those extra coordinates that are not standard coordinate variables. Technically speaking, heights is a coordinate variable. It works just fine, but it doesn't hurt to include it in the list of coordinates. And since we'd have to write the three other ones here anyways, because they're not coordinate variables, we'd have to have longitude, latitude, and time. Might as well go ahead and just include heights for completeness. That way it also works if we happen to change how heights um, is dimensioned. If you had heights that were a function of time, for instance, then it would no longer be a, a standard coordinate variable. And so that's how that ends up looking in the, in the CDL. We've got all of our different variables representing the station location, We've got our heights, station ID that is a two dimensional because it contains the strings, our scalar time, and then our, our 2D temperature away with all the coordinates listed here. So that's for profiles. The DSG spec contains information for doing time series, trajectories, and combinations of those. So you could do time series profiles or trajectory profiles or more convoluted combinations of those two things. Um, there's also information in there about um, what to do when, say, you have profiles, but they have different heights in them, or time series where you're getting different times for your time series. And use, there's different ways to represent that within the file, depending on um, some use cases are good if you have static data, some are better if you're collecting data in real time and don't know a priori um, what observations you're gonna have in your final output. Um, it gets a bit convoluted though, so it goes a bit beyond CF the basics. Um, but I do have links in the notebook to those sections of the CF spec. So, with that brief introduction to doing observation point data in the NetCD FCF, what questions do you have for me? Do you have to close it, close it before you write out the file? Uh, for the memory, the way I've opened these right now in memory, it's a little weird. So um, I think you might have to. Um, I certainly got mad at me before when I didn't. Um, in Python itself, when this variable goes out of scope, it should be closing it and saving it to disk, but it never hurts to go ahead and just say, uh, where are you? That never hurts. Actually, I think if you want it to close automatically when it goes out of scope, you have to be using a context manager because it doesn't have a construct uh, destructor in Python in the C++ sense of the word. So like with with NC as NetCDF, yeah, with, as, yeah. <laughs> it works with standard open in Python with the context manager or without. So if you use open in Python, if it goes out of scope, because if I was to say close and halt, that would shut down this notebook. It would issue a close to Python. It wouldn't just kill it. So it would go through and dereference all the objects. And when the NC object is dereferenced, that should, before it, goes a, go, before it gets garbage collected, execute its delete method. Assuming data sets implemented like that, it would at that point close. But I have no idea if it doesn't. So it's never a bad thing to be explicit. But yeah. Cool.
Uh, one thing I learned last year that was really helpful was that variable names never matter in CF. The only thing that CF does is it reserves the names of attributes. Yes, it is an attribute-based spec. So you can call any variable whatever you want it to be. It's all about how you specify relations between them and then sometimes how you are dimensioning them. Somebody has to have a question so we don't end uh, two minutes early. Is it only two? Okay. I will also say the fact that it's attribute-based metadata means it does make it relatively okay. compatible with other um, conventions. So if you know it only cares about specific attribute names that are its own, other things that don't have conflicting names can readily be included in the same file. So after you close it, uh, all the memory get cleaned up and you cannot reference back to the variable anymore, right? Yes. Other than maybe if, if you're reading a file, maybe some of the things you've pulled out into arrays are still avail available, but the variables and dimensions and all that have, have been cleaned up, provided everything's working properly. All right. Well, I'm just going to talk real slow until the <laughs> time is up, unless somebody stops me. <laughs> All right. No, I think we have a minute, but I think that's good enough. Uh, unless somebody else has one more question. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for coming. I have Unidata laptop stickers if anyone wants yeah. any. <laughs> Can't ever yes, have thank too you many all. You all have been great. On your computers or rocket boxes or whatever. Coffee mugs. Coffee mugs. All right. Thank you.